very much, Radi. First, I'd like to thank Monsignor Sorondo, Professors Ed de Roberts, and uh, Vandalie Bayano for the invitation. What I'm going to show to you in the next uh, 20 minutes is some kind of a summary of our work with the uh, Zika virus and the, how is the infection of the Zika virus in the developing brain. It's like a summary of our work over the last uh, one year and eight months. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, work of the team in my lab. In green are the people that are involved in the data that I'm going to show to you, mainly the, the people in the postdocs and uh, some of the students, and uh, in the right side of the slide, the collaborators in Brazil and also, of course, the sponsors of my lab. Okay, uh, Zika virus, it's a, it's a flavivirus, virus, right? It's from the, the same family, for example, of the dengue virus that's unfortunately also very common in Brazil. It is a RNA-based virus that's transmitted by a mosquito, and it was uh, first dis uh, described in uh, Uganda, Africa, in a forest called Zika. This is why the name of this virus is Zika virus. Uh, it's, it's, it's important to highlight that between 1947, when the virus was discovered, and 2007, so it's 60 years, only 14 cases were uh, described about people getting infected with the Zika virus. And then, when the virus reached the, the Polynesia, you started to have a huge increase in the number of uh, infections until, unfortunately, it arrived in Brazil uh, in 2013. This is the route of how the virus uh, reached Brazil, and it's believed that it arrived in Brazil during the uh, Confederation Cup. That's the, the uh, championship that's one year before the, the World Cup. And uh, unfortunately, when it arrived in Brazil, there was a huge increase in the number of cases of uh, microcephaly. On that time, it was not clear this uh, connection between the infection with the Zika virus and the increase in the number of cases of uh, microcephaly. Next one. Could you check, please, if there is a... Okay. And th there is one before, this one. So uh, it, it's, it's important to, 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 to mention that, like, when the cases of uh, microcephaly started to increase in Brazil, in our institute, we started to uh, uh, have access to, to, to the... To the uh, mothers with their, their babies, and then start to do some neuroimaging. And, and then, so this is some of the description of the, uh, of the images of the, the babies with microcephaly. And one thing that really uh, uh, was important and that we become to get uh, interested is that it was clear, based on the neuroimaging, that you have uh, lots of characteristics of the interruption of neurogenesis. So if you see in the middle of the, of the imaging, you see the, the image of the brain with uh, white dots. These white dots, they are like the calcifications, and it's clear associated with a hot in, the, in a, a stop of the, of the neurogenesis. And uh, with also having access to post-mortem brain, we also would like would be clear that like the, the connection and the, the, the effect of the virus directly in the, into the brain. Uh, based on that, and because we are working in the lab for, uh, during, the over, uh, during the last 10 years with uh, human cell models, including uh, nerve stem cells, astrocytes, neurospheres, and brain organoids, we decided to check, to test the hypothesis that the infection was causing the uh, malformations in the brain. So just a, a brief introduction about the kind of cells that we work in the lab. We are using the techn technique that was developed by Shinya Manaka in 2007 that's based on the reprogramming of uh, fibroblasts to, for them to, to behave as uh, pluripotent stem cells, which means that like, you can get cells from the skin and make them uh, differentiate into any cell type of the body. And we are focused on uh, creating uh, narrow cells. More than that, it's important to acknowledge the work uh, of uh, several uh, scientists during the last 70 years to creating three-dimensional cultures of brain cells, starting with Aromoscona, 
then go into uh, Reynolds and Weiss, then uh, Yoshik Sasai, and finally with the work of Madeleine Lancaster, in which they created what's called brain organoids. So based on the work with the, uh, this inducible prepotent stem cells, making them behave as nerve stem cells, and also in the work with these three-dimensional cultures, we started to uh, infect this kind of models with the uh, Zika virus. So this is just to show how we create these uh, brain organoids. We uh, culture them in these flasks, and each one of these uh, white uh, aggregates of cells, it's a brain organoid. When we cut them, it's very interesting because you see several characteristics of the developing brain, including the interconnected nuclear migration, the divisions of the cells close to the ventricle, and other markers of uh, brain development. There we are described in these uh, brain organoids. We can also follow the growth of them day by day, and uh, we can also see the very clear formation of, the, of these uh, layers of the, of the these brain organoids. And in the bottom, just a curiosity, we started also to see some of the pigment epithelium that's characteristic of the eyes. So in some of these organoids, we can see this uh, formation of the retina inside these brain organoids. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm just going to show to you the uh, consequence of the Zika infection for neurogenesis and the growth of these three-dimensional cultures, some insights about the molecular mechanisms associated with the infection, and finally, I'm going to show to you a, a platform based on these iPS cells to screen for new drugs that can be used against the Zika virus infections in the brain. So the first thing that we did was to get these nerve stem cells, and then we infect them with the uh, Zika virus. What you're seeing in blue are the uh, nuclei of these nerve stem cells, and in red is the antibody against one protein of the virus. And the, in the other side of the image, we're seeing an electron microscopy in which we're seeing these uh, brown dots. These are the virus inside the cells. We also show that like this uh, Zika virus is able to replicate inside the nerve stem cells. It's uh, clear in the, in the, with the red uh, bars. And uh, when we incubate not these uh, 2D cultures, but these brain organoids with the, the uh, Zika virus, we can see a uh, delay in the reduction in the growth of these brain organoids. That go uh, around 40% after 11 days. So we get the brain organoids, we infect them with this Zika virus, then we follow them day by day. And then after these 11 days, we show that there is a decrease uh, in between 30 to 40%. And what's interesting is that if you get the dengue virus that I mentioned to you that's uh, similar, it's like in the same family of this live virus, the, zen the dengue virus is able to infect the cells, but it doesn't kill the cells or change the growth of them, which at some sense is interesting too. That's not like an artifact of our model, but basically specifically caused by the Zika virus when in contact with nerve stem cells. One thing that then we became interested is that, okay, we know that these cells are being killed and that they are able, the, the Zika virus is able to stop the, the, the uh, growth of these brain organoids. But what happens in terms of the molecular and in terms of gene expression before the cells die? So when you, what you're seeing here is that uh, in the third days after the infection, the cells are already infected, but they are not dying. So we decided to... Uh, do proteomics and in silico analysis of these uh, cells already infected, but before then they're dying to see how the cells are behaving after the infection. So we did this uh, shotgun proteomics together with uh, in silico analysis, and uh, we found that there are several proteins that are being changed going up or down after the infection. And then we can summarize the effects in four more specific uh, uh, phases. One is that, of course, when the, the virus infects the cell, and then you have the viral replication. And then, after this viral replication, I'm going to show, to show later exactly how it happened, but you have a DNA damage. And because of the DNA damage and chromosome instability, you stop the cell cycle. After you stop the cell cycle, you don't have more neurogenesis. So this is how we believe that's the pathway after the, infec uh, after the infection and before the cells uh, died. And we, we published th this paper uh, in the beginning of this year, and it, it had a very uh, nice comment in science trans transitional medicine, highlighting that like not only the nerve stem cells, but also the radioglial cells that we showed that are also uh, being uh, dead by the Zika virus. And because of that, we started to uh, try to see which would be the, the cell type that are more uh, prone to die after the infection. So. Uh, 
and because of that, we switch gears from the nerves themselves to start to uh, study the astrocytes. And uh, as it was already mentioned uh, yesterday, astrocytes are very important for the, the metabolism of the brain and for all, all of the, uh, the, 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 the formation of the brain, of course, and all of the processes that happen in the, in the brain. And uh, we, we published another paper showing that we can get astrocytes from these brain organoids. And when we compare the astrocytes that we got from the uh, brain organoids with the real astrocytes that came from the real brain, they are very similar. What you're seeing here is comparing the, bra the, the gray and the black bars. These are real astrocytes from the real brain compared with the astrocytes that we got from the brain organoids. And the, in, the, in the right side of the, of the screen, you are seeing this comparison of the proteomics between the cell types. And we think that's a very interesting model to study astrocytes that are uh, generated from the uh, brain organoids. So we infected these uh, astrocytes and we compare the infection of uh, astrocytes with neurons and with near stem cells. And what we are seeing in this image is that you have much more infection in the astrocytes when you compare, for example, with the near stem cells. And there's basically no infection in differentiated uh, neurons after the, 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 they are exposed to, to the Zika virus. And then we, you, uh, now working specifically with the astrocytes, we show that the infection is also able to damage the mitochondria and to increase the levels of reactive oxygen species that we can also inhibit if you use, for example, ascorbic acid. And finally, when you get these astrocytes, we also see that after the infection, you have an increase in the DNA damage that you can see here based on the expression of HUAX and the phosphorylated P53. So to summarize this part of my talk, we believe that like the virus infects the cells, mainly the astrocytes after the infected the cells started to replicate inside the cell, probably into the endoplasmatic reticulum, and uh, after that started to uh, need energy, energy to, to, to replicate, and then damage the mitochondria, ROS is released, and ROS goes to the uh, DNA and damage the DNA. And this is why the cell stops to, to divide, and then they die. So it's basically the, the, the two proposals that we have, based on the transcriptoma, uh, proteomics in silico analysis and cell biology, trying to show and try to show exactly how the virus behave in human neural cells. And with that in mind, we decided to use high content screening uh, analysis to uh, search for uh, drugs that could be used by pregnant women. So we, we follow a library of uh, compounds that are already FDA approved and that can also be uh, used by pregnant women. So with that in mind, we uh, found uh, two drugs that can be used by pregnant women and that can be eventually uh, be used to treat it uh, if we have another outbreak of the Zika virus. One of these drugs uh, we published recently is the uh, chlorokine, and the, uh, that's it. the idea is that it's going to change, as, as Eddie already showed, the pH of the cells, and it uh, stops the, the replication of the virus. And the second one is called sofosbuvir, which is a drug that was, it's a more recent drug that was originally uh, used for uh, hepatitis C. So these two drugs can be used in pregnant women and can uh, eventually be the case of, uh, in, in, in a case of another uh, outbreak of the Zika virus. So just to summarize, this is the, 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 uh, our work using the Zika virus as uh, using actually the, the uh, nerve stem cells, human nerve stem cells derived from industrial pluripotent stem cells being differentiated in nerve stem cells, astrocytes, neurons, neurospheres, and uh, brain organoids, and trying to uh, describe the consequence of the infection to the uh, human nerve cells, and also some drugs that can be uh, used in the, in the clinics. So first, we showed the uh, characterization of the, of the malformations in the brain. That's not only the microcephaly, but th there are unfortunately several others changes in the, in, in the brain, and it depends when the infection happens, okay? So later, during pregnancy, the consequences are different from when the, the infection happens earlier. And we described it, it uh, 
what are the, the, the kind of infection or the kind of malformations that we can see. After that, we show that like uh, that the virus is able to infect and has some kind of tropism for the nerves themselves and that they uh, kill the cells. And using these models of uh, neurospheres and brain organoids, we also show that they have changes in morphology and uh, changes in, in, the, in, the, in the formation of the neurospheres. Then we uh, described this uh, molecular fingerprint of these uh, nerve cells after the infection and uh, showing that there are at least four phases in which the uh, cells are, 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 are infected. First, the uh, viral replication, then you have the uh, change in the DNA damage, of course, and the chromosomal instability, which makes the cell cycle rest, and finally the cells die, and then there's no more formation of the brain, um, interrupting the formation of the cortical uh, plates. And finally, using a high-content uh, screening uh, approach, we uh, uh, describe the two drugs that can be used for this uh, in the case of another outbreak. And as a last slide, just to, uh, to be used, uh, to, that we can discuss later in the, in the, in the, in the afternoon session, uh, about the future of science in Latin America. I truly believe that like, we definitely have to encourage collaborations among neighbors and uh, trying to attract international scientists to the region. I think that, of course, it was <coughs> very important <coughs> for me to be uh, uh, in the U.S. For, for a long time, but now I think that's more important to really have more connections with uh, colleagues from Latin America. And as a personal experience, I have uh, collaborations with uh, Chilean uh, uh, scientists, Argentina and Mexico, and basically all of them, they are uh, Pew Fellows as well. So, so the, 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 the time that was uh, as a Pew Fellow was very important to make these connections. And uh, it's interesting to, to realize that, like, especially in Chile and Argentina, that we are so close to each other that like a three to four hours uh, flight, it's basically change of life in terms of like having a postdoc coming to, to, to your lab and then can go to the, to the, the weekends to their hometown. So it's very important and definitely have to encourage that. And the other thing is that uh, we definitely have to bring more international scientists to the region. I have a very interesting experience with uh, students from Slovenia, Serbia, and Poland, that they came to the lab, did their PhD here, or part of the PhD here, then, then come back. So I think that we can do it, we can uh, encourage these uh, collaborations among the neighbors, and also try to be more attractive to uh, scientists, not only from, the, from the, uh, Eastern Europe, but from all over the world. So with that, I, I uh, finish my talk, and thank you very much for the opportunity.